Welcome to the Taipei Broadcasting Station's Resident Messenger Program. I'm your host, Ross Darrell Feingel. Today, I am joined by Chef Ernest. Hi Welcome, guys. Chef. Hi, I'm Ernest. Chef, some... chef Ernest is, is the chef at one of Taipei's most interesting restaurants called NKU. And Ernest, NKU stands for? NKU stands for Nordic Keep Uni. So it's basically a restaurant that uh, was originally planned to, to have a Nordic theme. So you get a feel of Scandinavia when you walk in. Okay, a feel of Scandinavia, but uh, listeners who are listening carefully can tell, Ernest, you have a bit of a Singapore accent. I do la. <laughs> <laughs> cannot be hidden when I speak in English or in Mandarin. Yeah, uh, well, I, I'll give you some latitude on the Mandarin, but in English, you, you <laughs> definitely sound like you, you grew up in Singapore, which in fact you did. Mm -hmm. uh, now tell us a little bit about growing up in Singapore. We're, was cooking always an interest of yours? Yes. Because, you know, Singaporeans are big foodies. They love, they love their, you know, when I lived in Singapore, uh, you, the colleagues in the office, on a hot day, I mean, every day in Singapore is hot, mm -hmm. but, but, but it's 35 degrees outside, and at 12, 15, say, so let's get in the car, let's drive 20 minutes just to find some noodle stall because it's the best stall in Singapore for that kind of noodle. So Singaporeans big foodie. So tell us, when you were a child, did you want to be a chef? No, not not at all. Because I think my, my family, they are, uh, are, you know, typical Asian parents you know, on the more practical side. But I think eating eating was a big part of our culture, like you said, in, in Singapore. So we love to eat. And my parents take us out to eat quite often. I was actually really, really fat when I was a kid. <laughs> But uh, yeah, eating eating was a big part of, of my, my childhood. And when my, my mom cooks at home, so when she cooks, I would always be interested, you know, hovering around the kitchen. And I started I started cooking young, right? 11 years old. Mm -hmm. yeah, so what style of cooking did your mother cook at home? Oh, very typical home cooking Asian food, but mm -hmm. because of, uh, we, we like to eat. So my mom would like try to replicate some recipes that we eat outside. I think trying to, uh, like sometimes she tries to give us a treat or like my dad lo loves to eat steak. So she tries to make steak at home in, in effort to make it healthier in a way. Mm. So we cook at home a lot. Okay, so uh, you had the mix of the East and West mm. uh, as a child growing up in, in, the, in the kitchen. But then in university, you, you studied nutrition. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. So when I was in, in high school, or in Singapore, we call it secondary school. Uh, I was, like I said, I was a fat, I was a fat kid. Uh, but when I was about to graduate, I just had a, a sudden urge to, to lose all my weight. So I, I took on exercising and dieting. I took, I took, in four months, I lost around 20, 20 kilograms. It was Congratulations, just, that's amazing. It was, it was, it sounds really like impressive, but it, actually it's not very healthy to lose that much, that, that much weight at, at such a fast pace. So after I did that, uh, and I was thinking, where should I go for college or for polytechnic? I actually realized that huh, this, this was not very good, not a very natural, healthy way of, of, of losing weight. And it, it resulted in some skin complications. So. I decided that I want to learn how to eat properly and in future I can teach people how to eat properly. People who went through that stage, who have to go through that stage of like ah, weight problems and, and, and the, kind of the anxiety caused by it or the stress caused by it, I want to do it properly and teach people how to do it properly. So I decided to go for nutrition. And when you were studying nutrition, what are some of the most important things they told you? Uh, I think it destroyed a lot of uh, what do we put on that with myths that most people have? Then you're like, oh, you want to lose weight, you got to cut down on the fat, or you got to take out all the sugars. It's not exactly true. So, uh, I mean, that's why we pay nutritionists or dietitians that amount of money. <laughs> so, uh, I think that's one of it. I think people mistake mistaken a lot of uh, uh, information that exercise would just make you healthy or lose weight. Actually, exercise is maybe just 20, 30 percent of the entire formula. Thing. And nutrition takes up most of it. So you have to eat properly, understand our bodies. So I think that taught me a lot. But if you're learning about nutrition in a, in a country, Singapore, that's renowned for its delicious street food or the hawker food, as they call it mm. in Singapore. A lot of it is stir fried. 
it's, it's delicious, but it's a little bit greasy, even though uh, the Singapore government is very good. And, well, they're, you know, they're, they like to manage things closely, but they're, they're well, very good, even in the hawker centers, the street food, uh, encouraging customers to ask the vendors to use less salt, less sugar, less, less oil. How, how do you reconcile traditional Asian cooking of this kind, you know, this kind of stir fry, street food, uh, using the skin of the chicken, you know, these kinds of things with good nutrition. I think uh, we need a good balance. I think, uh, of course, this is our culture, eating. And if you look at it as a chef uh, standpoint of view, uh, Singaporean culture, it's really a really balanced mix of different uh, ethnic groups. And all this comes together, resulting in us having like a big variety of, of delicious foods. Uh, but then again, when Singapore was in its country building stages, you know, I think we need to understand like how how did Singaporean food or culture came about? I mean, I'm talking about the eating culture. So people back then they were poor, and we relied on seasoning or uh, very salt, very strong seasoning, salt, sugar, oil, to give us flavor in our food. You know, we didn't really and we don't have really have ingredients grown in the country. We're not big on agriculture. And, big it's just a we had no agriculture whatsoever so uh, the thing is all this all our food rely on seasoning and sauces so that makes our food really pretty unhealthy really oily salty sweet like people will say like ah you have really uh, you, have, you have a sweet tooth or you're, 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 your taste buds are strong uh, and I think uh, really cheap street foods makes it you know difficult for people to have proper food choices because uh, when I was studying as a nutritionist, uh, I think most dietitians and even health promotion board in Singapore, they have the, the, the biggest challenge is how do you convince people to eat healthily, but then the most readily available food is street food. And that's also the most, you know, the cheapest option, the most economical option. So that's the biggest challenge in Singapore. And uh, I think people, of course, who are well off, they have uh, stronger spending power, they can definitely afford to eat healthier or they can afford to go for the better ingredients but we have to look at the other side of the spectrum the people who are in the lower income group or people who are struggling they might not be able to afford that and that's where the skill of the nutritionist or the dietitian have to come in it's not just purely nutritional knowledge they have to have understanding of the, the demographics of these people then they can do a better job at advising and helping and then you decided i'm not going to be a full-time nutritionist, dietitian, I want to be a cook. How did you make make that decision? What inspired that at that point? To be honest, at this stage, I do not, uh, I would say I do not, it's more of, I still have that nutritionist side in me. I, I really feel like uh, people should be eating properly. I think I really want people to, you know, have access to good and healthy food. And not to ridiculous price because we know how much organic food costs nowadays. Uh, it's just that uh, to answer your question, at that point of time, uh, I was still young and I was pursuing interests more than practicality. And I was lucky because my parents they didn't have to rely on me to, you know, to feed them. So uh, I went on the I went on a TV show. Uh, it was a competition for home cooks. Supposedly home cooks. There were a lot of professionals. <laughs> So, and, and I, I met uh, one of the judges, so he's a chef of a Michelin star restaurant. He has two Michelin stars now, congratulations to him. Uh, he's my first mentor and he's really, really uh, awesome. And I, he invited me to the restaurant to learn, he said, if you're interested, you can come for an internship. And I went there and then I had a feel of what restaurant life really was. At the start, to be honest, I was really hesitant on being a cook because, like you know, cooking you have long hours, you have really not very good remuneration, high stress, and... Yeah, yeah I was thinking the stress, you know, the customers... Uh, <laughs> it's not a lucrative job, to be honest. That's why I tell people when they come to an interview. So, uh, but then it was really fun. It was really exhilarating because of the high stress. And I think uh, the most important one was meeting real people. The people, I was lucky. I was in a team where everyone was like, you know, really bonded together and they, you know, we helped each other out as, as friends. And I think that first environment, first impression was so important because if we look at it at the other side, if a, a young cook went into a kitchen that was horrible, was toxic, I would really doubt that this person would want to pursue a career 
further on. So I think I was lucky that the, my first mentor in the environment was super good. And then after that initial internship, did you go for formal training at a cooking school? No, I did not. I actually just went straight into to to cooking in, in restaurants. I, I I was I was uh, considering. I was offered a, a scholarship in uh, a place in the university, but I was hesitant on spending a huge sum of money into school. I actually decided to work first, and I went to Europe for backpacking, and I went for internships, straight on to learn. So you yeah. went to Europe with your backpack and you knocked on the door of a restaurant and you said, I have some experience with a, a Michelin star restaurant in Singapore. Could I come cook for you? And, and they said yes. They, some, they gave you that opportunity. Because, yes. you know, we think of those mm -hmm. restaurants in Europe with those very serious, you know, like the, we won't name specific countries. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, they take their, their cooking tradition very seriously uh, mm -hmm. as well. And, and you, even though they might welcome people who are not from that country, uh, people from different parts of the world, uh, they still seem to have that very serious educational aspect to entering the industry. Mm -hmm. And ha so, how did you say, "Yeah, you know, I could do this job," even though I didn't go to, uh, you know, Cordon Bleu or some famous cooking school? It was scary. Like I, I sent quite a lot of emails and I, I asked like my, my previous chefs if they could help me hook up with friends. And yeah, it was it was pretty scary. I mean, some agreed even before I went there. And I went when I was there. I knocked on a few doors as well. Uh, I think for one thing, you have to prove your, your worth. If, I mean, of course, if you can't do the job, they might just assign you something you know, in respect picking herbs or doing some random jobs. But I think if you prove that, you're, prove that you, they would let you do like, things. Because I think all restaurants, they are low on manpower, so <laughs> they could always use an extra hand. So I think it was a lot of initiative and they, they appreciated it. It was good. And part of the time you were in Europe, you were uh, cooking in a restaurant in Copenhagen. Yes. What is Danish cuisine for those mm -hmm. in the audience who don't know anything about it? To, to be honest, uh, I'm not an expert in Danish cuisine. Whatever I say, it's really just my experience, what I see. Uh, in, in Denmark, uh, it's pretty cool and it's very different from the other European countries like France, Italy, even Germany. Uh, in France and Italy, they have a very serious case of you know, grandma grandmother syndrome. Like, oh, food you, food is supposed to be like that. This is the traditional way. In in Denmark, they are a little bit more modernized. They are very open to you know new things, you know, new ways of cooking. And I think that the diff, uh, another thing is that Denmark is very big on uh, organic agriculture. Like basically everything you see is organic. So no one has to market anything organic. Uh, they, they really care about environment. I think a lot of demographics makes this possible. So uh, when I was in Denmark, uh, what is really Danish? Uh, I think in, in Copenhagen, I was it was close to the sea. They had a lot of seafood. Uh, so they went in, in winter, you get things like herring, you get a lot of fresh uh, fish. You know, they, they like raw fish, so there's a lot of like cured fish and stuff like not that. Not the same as Japanese style sashimi. No, no, no. Uh, no. Yeah, that cure, European style cure fish, that's something quite different. No, it's <laughs> salty, it's yeah. smoky, you get a lot of pickles, and I think uh, the typical Asian who goes there, they're gonna have a bit of a uh, challenge, but <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, I grew I grew up eating a lot of things, so I, I, I quite liked it. I didn't, the really cold weather, I didn't like that, but <laughs> uh, I think Danish, um, it's rather similar to other parts of Europe in some aspects. They love potatoes, they have a lot of bread, they have charcuterie, cheese, dairy products. So, yeah. And what good. about the desserts? Oh, desserts are really sweet. I think that they, they, they love baked products. I think in, in, in Copenhagen, there are a lot of uh, patisseries and bakeries, which is a super good thing. They're, they're super, super tasty. Well, you're, you're supposed to be a nutritionist and watching your way. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to pick the whole grain products. <laughs> Sometimes you just cannot resist. Like the best croissants I actually had were not in, in France, they were actually in, in, in Copenhagen. So, And, and you uh, decided to come back to Asia though. Well, why not continue building your career in Europe? I was considering, but uh, I wanted to be somewhere near home. Actually, the, the first reason I went, I came back because I had ran out of funds. But <laughs> I had to well, those must have been some very low paying internships. <laughs> it's expensive in, in, in Denmark. Denmark is Almost the cost of, of living is around Singapore level, so really do yeah, like any major global city. Yeah, mm. yeah. So, uh, but I wanted to explore Asian routes. I think maybe that's why I chose Taiwan. 
-hmm. Yeah, so I went back home. I wanted to be somewhere in Asia because I felt like uh, the trip to Europe uh, gave me an interesting insight was that, uh, you know, young cooks nowadays, we're always learning the mother of cuisine, French cuisine. We, we would, uh, you know, explore Western food and, and, and all this. But I think as Asian people, when I went there, I was like stressed. I was worried that, you know, if people asked me to cook something from back home and I do not know how to do that, it's going to be really embarrassing. So before I went there, I actually learned to cook a few of our local dishes. And then it's chicken rice, curries, uh, coconut rice, and I think there's one more, some uh, Hokkien noodles. So when I went there, I was prepared in some aspects. <laughs> but um, so when I came back, I realized that I really wanted to uh, explore my own culture. So I wanted to stay in Asia. And so when you came back from uh, Denmark, you first worked in Singapore yes. for a period of time. What kind of restaurants did you, did you work? Uh, similar concepts, mostly fine dining restaurants. So before I went to Europe, I was already working mm -hmm. at a fine dining restaurant. And when I came back, I went back to the same one. And then the chef, uh, he left and he opened his own fine dining restaurant. So I went there for a little bit. Yeah, but were you able to get onto the menu and anything from your experience in in, uh, in, in uh, Copenhagen and in part of the world? No, because you said, you know, some of that cured fish. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the chef had already a clear vision of what he wants to do. So I think it was more of uh, following and learning. Okay, well, speaking of vision, we'll, we'll talk about... Ernest's uh, vision for NKU, his current restaurant in Taipei, when we come back from this break. You're listening to Residence Messenger Program on Taipei Broadcasting Station. Welcome back to the Residence Messenger Program on Taipei Broadcasting Station. I'm your host, Ross Darrell Feingold. Today we're joined by Chef Ernest from Taipei Restaurant NKU. Chef Ernest, you were telling us about uh, vision. And that in the previous restaurant you, you were working in Singapore, the chef had the vision, had his own vision. That's understandable. It was his restaurant. And then you had a chance to come to Taipei and join NKU and bring your vision to this restaurant. Tell us about that vision. Uh, to be honest, when I first took over NKU, uh, the vision was rather blur because. Uh, Wait, just, just so our audience understand, when a Singaporean says blur, what do they mean? <laughs> uh, I in Mandarin be more cool, but it's, I'm not exactly like crystal clear what what I'm going for. I mean, I, there are, I have principles, I have things that I want to achieve, but I think a vision is way more than that. So I took a bit of time to adjust and understand and, and the processes were, were how, do, how do I put it? It was difficult because it, I, had to, I had to juggle myself, I had to juggle a team, I had to juggle a business. So I took a bit of time, but uh, as of now, I'm actually really clear what I'm going for. I think the division is not so uh, pinpoint on one aspect of a restaurant. It's not just the cooking. It's not maybe not just reputation or money. I think all these are important for a restaurant to be a good restaurant. But my vision is for a, it's a culture. I wouldn't say a culture in Taiwan. I'm, I don't believe that one person can change the world. I, but I believe that I can change the I can affect the environment for my team. I can build a culture in the company for the people that who are in it. So my vision is for the company to be very people focused. We want to invest uh, all, a lot of our time, effort, uh, money into mentorship into the people, because then the people can do better things. They can be the, the team can be more value added for the customer. I think um, in part of it is I also want to change in, in Taiwan's F&B culture some things that are uh, traditions. They need to be changed or need to be broken. For example, I think most Asian people uh, look at front of house people as a dakong side. It's just a job. It's not really a profession. I think that needs to be changed because cooking, cooks, we got lucky because in 10, 20 years ago, the media made cooks celebrities. So kind of got out of the bracket, but I think the, the front of house people, they do, they did not. When you say front of the house, you mean the, uh, what we like to call the maitre d', the oh, hosts, the service, and, the, and host. the service people, the waiters, or maybe or even the wine people. Mm -hmm. I think wine people get a bit lucky as well because wine is a beverage in, in societal status. It's like a expensive, classy thing, mm -hmm. yeah, but I would say yeah, the service, the host, I think they are equally important. And I arm them with as much as much knowledge about the restaurant, be it 
they may just not the one cooking, but they are the one serving, noticing, you know, the details about the guests. They are like my eyes and my hands in front of the guests. So they tried everything on the menu, hopefully. Yes, they do. They have, they would have to. Yeah, because one thing that annoys me is when you go to a restaurant and you say, uh, you know, what do you recommend? Does this one taste good? And they say, I haven't tried it. You, know, you just wonder what's going on exactly between the chef and the and the staff. But you mentioned the culture and the culture from in Taiwan might have the F and B food and beverage culture might have some things that you'd want to change or is different. So coming from another country to Taiwan, and you had not only had, had worked in, in Singapore restaurants, but you had worked in Europe as well. What were some things that were very challenging for you? Or let's put a positive spin on this. What were some things that you were pleasantly surprised about when you joined a restaurant here in Taipei? That you thought, wow, that, that's great that they do things this way. Uh, it's the good and the bad. I, <laughs> I would. And to be honest, the same thing is good and bad. It's really just the perspective. So I, in, in, like I said earlier on about the vision, I took some time to understand the process, the environment. Uh, and maybe at the start, I was more resistant to change. Now I'm really more like embracing it. So when I first came to Taiwan, I was a little bit, uh, I didn't like that uh, the Taiwanese people with Singaporean people. Singaporean people are very straightforward. Taiwanese people are a little bit more polite. They're very polite, so they don't go straight on direct to the point that things maybe they don't they don't agree or they don't you know they just go around the bush so i actually initially i thought that oh this is so inefficient i, I really would just want an answer yes or no but then i realized that uh it's the culture here let's embrace it and it, it, to be honest it brings around you know a, a good feeling around people you know, you're, you're you're kind you're polite so i think that's one of the things um I think people, uh, because we, I like to focus a lot more on the people and the team, uh, there is a, quite a big difference in the Taiwanese young, youngsters and the Singaporean youngsters. I think one uh, important factor is that in Singapore, the guys have to go to the military. In Taiwan, they do, but it's really short and I'm not sure if the supposed outcomes are achieved. But uh, yeah, it makes the, the kids a bit different uh, in terms of how we, we, we teach them, how we have to, you know, the, the leadership methods, it has to change with time. Mm -hmm. yeah, so I think these two are one of the, the biggest uh, change that I had to get used to. <laughs> Tell us a bit about the menu and, and mm -hmm. some of the things here, because uh, you, you said the concept is, it, it's your own, it's, it's unique, you're, you're not running a Singaporean restaurant. No. Right? So, mm -hmm. so if, if Anyone in the audience uh, thinks they're going to get you know baku te and 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 prawn me and I'm going to I'm going to try and impress you with all the, <laughs> all the different things I, I know from Singapore cuisine. You're uh, good. You're good. They're they're not going to get those at your restaurant. Correct? No, I would direct them to Songfa or maybe to JL restaurant in Taichung. It's really really good. But, mm. Yeah. Okay, so what's on your menu? Uh, we, we don't we don't do uh, we're not limited by a cuisine. It's not French. It's not European. It's not Taiwanese. It's not Singaporean for sure. So, uh, we just just really call it cooking. Uh, I like to say it's cooking with a lot of uh, local Taiwanese ingredients. Uh, I mean, of course, there are a little bit things that are, some things that are from overseas. I mean, olive oil, you can never get olive oil in, in, in Taiwan. But um, we, we, we try to do cooking that you, maybe the guests or the people here might not think that ah, it's like, it can be like that. So in a way, that's a surprise. Uh, we do a lot more fruits, vegetables, nuts and seeds. I think that's a bit of the nutrition part in me. I don't really like to focus a lot on like meats, like as per traditional uh, Eurocentric cuisine. Uh, so I, I try to, I think the menu is like 70% fruits and vegetables, nuts and seeds. Uh, that's one thing you can expect in the food. We try to explore Taiwan's uh, ingredients. I think it's going to sound very, how do you put it? <laughs> Very common if we say, ah, we are local, local bar, or mm. we try to explore. Well, you know, a lot of the restaurateurs that uh, uh, are doing fusion cuisine, or even just non-local cuisine, mm. uh, French cuisine, Italian cuisine, uh, very often they do try to source as many ingredients as, as possible mm -hmm. locally. So, you know, it sounds like uh, you've had a lot of success doing that. It hasn't been a big a, a challenge as some might assume. I I wouldn't. For, at least for me, I wouldn't. I don't like to use the word success, especially when I uh, convey that to my team. It would sound like, "Ah, oh, we're already there, and there's nothing to push for." So we we would like to say as we will con we we love what 
the direction of what we're doing and yes maybe we have uh, collaborations with a lot of good farms we are doing a lot of locality in this aspect but we would really like to continuously push and learn more like actually this year we learned that in spring the bamboo season is rather erratic like you can get the normal uh, green bamboo called Lui Zuzun or and, and such very common but we wanted to use Makino bamboo and that the, the period of uh, harvest is pretty short and the, the, the villagers don't usually like to keep it fresh they just cook it away or preserve it yeah so it was interesting like i've been i've been here like my third year and my sous chef is a taiwanese and we never knew that so i think that's one of the things and we went foraging we, we started a lot of foraging this last month so we're going up to the mountains for a bit so we might see you on the you know, uh, you know one morning up in the mountains foraging <laughs> for uh different kinds of uh, uh Vegetables. vegetables. Well, what kinds would you be looking for? Last week we got like a bunch of pine. And we won't say where it is because we want that to be your secret <laughs> location. No, it's for fine. <laughs> Everyone's welcome to join and join us. Yes, uh, we do, We go for pine shoes. I think I got some wood for smoking. Uh, it's all uh, 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 how how do I put it? It's not a illegal <laughs> operation. It's perfectly legal. We checked our 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 rights. So. Uh, yeah, usually pine shoots or sometimes we see a lot of ferns and most of the time these trips uh, They are not with objectives. We don't really uh, I'm looking for this. I'm looking for this. It's more of let's explore the nature nature sites and Understand the land understand the weather and the culture and see what's edible. I think that's really the, the, the Spirit of foraging and how often are, are you changing? Uh, what's what's on the menu? Uh, it's really based on uh, the amount of information we get on our ingredients. Like for example, I said the bamboo earlier. Bamboo earlier. So the Bakino bamboo is really just the harvesting time is about three weeks to a month. And if, if it's over and they don't have it, it means we don't have it. So sometimes the dishes lifespan is really based on that. Some mm -hmm. ingredients, maybe it's longer and then we can keep it on. Some ingredients are not affected by it. They're available all year round. Maybe that dish stays for a longer time. So. Sometimes it's like it's like that, and you welcome yeah. customers. I, I hope who, who say, "Can I get a little more of this and a little less of that?" You're not one of those chefs who says, "No, no, no, no. this is my domain. Don't, don't, <laughs> don't tell me you want more or less of this or that uh, vegetable or, or topping." It, it depends. Uh, I I really do not like it when a guest like uh, because when I design a dish, the proportions are in place. So I I, I know you like this part of the dish, but. I don't usually like to do that. Like I want more of the topping and more of the side dish. I don't really do, don't like to do that. But when the guest comes and they say like they prefer to have more vegetables or less meat, or I, I'm happy to accommodate that. Yeah, and what about vegetarians and vegans? Yeah, I, I I do all this no problem. Just you know tell us in advance so we can prepare a menu for you. There's a lot of restaurants uh, in Taiwan. Uh, they still struggle with that. Or they say, oh, I got to ask the chef. And, I, I've seen vegetarians or vegans say, "Well, I'm just asking for rice and vegetables or pasta and vegetables. What's hold the meat <laughs> or, mm -hmm. or hold the cheese? Why, why is this such a big a big deal? Why do you think uh, uh, sometimes these things are challenging in, in Taiwan?" I understand because uh, I think when those chefs they they prepare a tasting menu or an a la carte menu, they uh, they spend a lot of time and effort, and they don't just want to make a random substitution or um, a rice and vegetable dish because it wouldn't reflect well of their vision or their, their purpose. So I can understand, but uh, I would love to do that because I think for one, it's a challenge for the team. And for the other, when I don't cook professionally, I try to eat vegetarian because I don't like the, the support. The, I don't like to eat commercially grown animals so much. I think the time in Denmark also made me view meat in a different perspective. So I'm happy to accommodate vegetarians and vegans. And now that we're getting into the summer, and you mentioned uh, uh, fruits before, uh, what are some fruits that are going to be either with the main courses or the desserts during the summer months? Uh, I uh, Currently, I'm using mango in, in Taiwan. Mango is very prized. Everyone loves to eat it. I think we the, the, one of the positive outlooks of the coronavirus issue is that Taiwan has uh, way much way lesser exports so fruits they are, are you saying the price is going down yes basically <laughs> yes the, the supply is high and the demand is much lower i think mm -hmm. because last year mangoes were atrocious the prices were ridiculous and this year they are atrocious as well but 
on the opposite side of the spectrum. They're really, really cheap. You mean the, the price is atrocious for the sellers. It's great <laughs> for the buyers. But how does it taste? How does this year's crop it's taste? It's super, actually. It's still as good. Because, of, I mean, of course, you have to pick the farmers. You have to go for mm -hmm. the right ones or if they know their thing. But yesterday, I bought mangoes. They were ridiculously cheap. And, of course, I picked them. I tasted them on the spot. And I was mm -hmm. like, happy to buy them. I, I had to, like, have two big baskets and I couldn't take all myself. I had to get a separate car for that. Oh, that is a lot of mangoes. Uh, you mentioned the virus. Mm -hmm. How does the, this affect what you do in the restaurant, especially the nature of what you do at, at NKU? Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, uh, the situation impacts a, a, a high volume of fast food restaurant very differently than how it, how it would affect what, what you do. So tell us a little bit about uh, the, the situation at uh, and what it means for NKU, for your staff, for your guests, what you do in the kitchen. I mean, the outbreak first uh, started. It was really worrying. I had to make I had to make a decision. If I if we had to go the usual routes like you know restaurants in in, in the U.S. and Europe or even in Asia, uh, are you going to close? Going to do takeouts? Are you going to do both? What are you going What are you going to do? I had to make a decision, and I think that was one of the. It was tough, but I think on the on the flip side, I was being really positive about it. I mean, I still am. It's just that I felt like I'm, I'm young. Uh, the team is young. We have not been through a pandemic. And I think if my hope is to be a business owner, this would be a super training to make sense. It's a teaching moment. Exactly. It was, it was perfect. So I decided to uh, push my team. We're going to do dining. We're going to do takeout. We're going to do... Uh, uh, more accessible menu options. So we had options, we had a lot of options. So we did that, and uh, subsequently, Taiwan was like re in a really okay place. Like the, it didn't get worse. In fact, it got better. So uh, I think that uh, well, we, I had the worst case scenario prepared, but things didn't go down south. Uh, it was a very good teaching moment, and. We still do takeouts. We do a la carte menu. We do our usual tasting menus. It's tough on the team. Like I just had to rush a takeout before I came here. Um, but the 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 I think the situation in Taiwan, I I think it was is positive. So I continue doing dining a little bit more than takeouts because when I assessed my revenue for the last month. I mean, restaurant, our business model is for dining. It's not really for takeout. So I think most fine dining restaurants, they also know that. So if you if you look at most of the fine dining in, in Taipei, not much really uh, chose the takeout option. It's not really a, a viable business option. Mm -hmm. And even uh, platforms that, you know, encourage this, I mean, in Taiwan's demographics, it's not really a very yeah, viable I, I, the, the, Clearly the food delivery platforms are, are popular right now in, in Taipei as they are in other places around the world. But uh, it's important, as, as you explained, that you know, not every restaurant or, or uh, every menu uh, mm -hmm. is, is designed for that, nor should it be. And, and fortunately, uh, our audience can go to NKU and, and enjoy your great cooking right there at the restaurant because it's generally a business as usual yeah. situation. Uh, but the staff are trained for for, uh, of course, for uh, sanitizing and, and things like that as well, right? We have very high standards for hygiene, so I think people don't shouldn't be worried. I think, uh, I, I'm not sure who told me, I mean, my, my, my staff told me this, but uh, it was interesting. <laughs> the younger cooks in the industry, they, they, told, they told my staff that you know, our restaurants is one of the toughest to work at because of the, the demands that I, the standards I, I demand from, from them. So, Which is exactly why the customer should go there and enjoy, <laughs> enjoy the food. Basically, uh, we are very keen, yes. <laughs> uh, Ernest, uh, give us, give us uh, some information about how uh, people can find you. Do you have a, a Facebook mm -hmm. page? I have face. I do have a Facebook page. It's my name, Ernest Toh, mm -hmm. or in, in on Instagram. I, my name is Ernest, right? So not so Ernest. <laughs> but you can you can look for me on the NKU Instagram page, so NKU Firewood. NKU Firewood. Yes. Uh, and uh, what's the best way to uh, make a reservation? Just call up. Just text us. Call us. It's it's all it's all good. And just let us know if, what what you would you like. You know, you come for a celebration, for an anniversary. You're more than happy to have anyone. Well, thank you so much for, for uh, coming on the show today and sharing your experience cooking around the world. And I have to say, we're so lucky to have you here in Taiwan with your diverse experiences cooking in Europe and in Singapore and, and creating 
uh, NKU. So thank you very much, Ernest. Thank you, Ross. You've been listening to Residence Messenger on Taipei Broadcasting Station. Have a great weekend.